Well, good afternoon uh, or good morning or good evening, uh, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to this uh, LSE Ideas event and debate uh, between myself and uh, Michael Burley. Uh, my name is Professor Mick Cox or Michael Cox. I'm a founding director of LSE Ideas, which goes back to 2008. I'm emeritus professor here at the Department of International Relations at the LSE, where I've been since 2002-3. I think that's enough autobiography for a moment. Um, I thought this debate is one that we ought to be having, in large part because the debate about the current crisis of democracy, the current crisis of liberalism, where is the world going, during the age of COVID and even before COVID hit, and I think that's important to stress, is a debate that needs uh, to be had. Uh, Michael Burley, I think, would need very little introduction, the author of several uh, well-renowned, well-reviewed books on, on a series of subjects to do with European and world history and terrorism and many, many other things beside. And he was our first Engelsberg lecture, uh, professor rather, here at the LSE and LSE Ideas. And uh, so we're going to have a debate and a discussion. Um, I'm going to begin with the end of history, or more precisely, with the argument put forward by an American State Department official, actually, called Francis Fukuyama, an American, uh, who wrote in 1989 uh, an article I don't suppose many people at first read, but certainly got picked up on very, very quickly indeed by a, a very large number of readers, some of who interpreted it correctly and some of who didn't. But it took off. So I always say it's the best way to get yourself noticed is to have a good title for a book or for an article. And the end of history is certainly a title and an idea that took off very, very rapidly and almost came to define the next 10 years to some, de to some degree. But what, what did Francis Fukuyama actually say and I want to kind of clarify that a bit because although I think there were certain things he said which I think have been understood I think there's certain things he said also which I think have been slightly misunderstood I could also say by way of autobiography I actually met Francis Fukuyama on more than one occasion uh, I met him on a radio program in Los Angeles in nine, just before the 1980s and it's very interesting what he was saying then he was actually an expert on the Soviet Union and the Third World, which most people don't know about. And in his writings on what he saw as the retreat of socialism, the defeat of Marxism, the retreat of collectivism, actually his work really begins with thinking about what's happening in the so-called Third World, as it was then called. And his argument is basically one that starts not with what's happening in Eastern Europe in 1989 or the USSR, although that forms part of his analysis more generally, he sees that in a sense as a, a continuation of a process which has been going on since the late 1970s and into the 1980s, which is seeing the intellectual failure of Marxism, intellectuals themselves retreating from Marxism, and that Marxist applied policies, particularly in the third world, retreating for a variety of reasons, but largely because in his view, they were failing. So much of his analysis doesn't actually begin with Eastern Europe in 89, though it picks it up on that. It begins with the Third World and what's happening there. And that's what we actually discussed in this very, what I thought was a very interesting radio program at the time. He, wrote, he did this program with me, or I did it with him much before he wrote the article. And then along in 1989, then I noticed this article appearing called The End of History, written by this nice young man, uh, Francis Fukuyama, The End of History. Uh, what did he mean by it? Let me just get that out of the way first before we jump into the analysis as well, whether we're seeing the end of the end of history, as both Michael and I are going to suggest, I think. He didn't mean the end of history with a small h. He didn't think that suddenly the world was stopping, like a clock was coming to an end in 1989. Um, he didn't actually say it would be the end of conflict either. In fact, Towards the end of the article, the end which very few people actually read, by the way, they come away with the slogan, but very often not very much with what he said later on in, in the piece. He actually just didn't say the conflict was going to come to an end. 
And he actually, actually identified two possible sources of future conflict in the world. One was religion, uh, which of course later got taken up by Samuel Huntingdon in his famous article, The Clash of Civilization, and the whole question of religious identity. And then secondly, he, he talked at, at some length, although not in great detail, about nationalism. In fact, he even made a reference in the article to what was then happening in Northern Ireland, where I was at that time living. So he didn't say conflict was going to come to an end. And as I've already suggested, third, it's not just about what's happening in Eastern Europe. He's seeing what's happening in Eastern Europe as a result of Gorbachev's policies outlined through Perestroika, Uskarenia, and uh, all the other policies identified with Gorbachev as not as a renewal of Marxism, but in a way, the death of Marxism. I think he read that right. I think he read that right. The Gorbachev may have still wanted to remain a socialist, which indeed he remained. He may have indeed wanted to just see a reform of the USSR. He may have wanted to see just a reform of the relations with Eastern Europe. But I think Fukuyama did call it right by saying that underneath what Gorbachev was saying through his various uh, utterances on ideology, the end of the great clash with the West, new thinking on foreign policy, it was actually, and I, I took that view myself at the time, not a declaration of surrender or flying of the white flag, but at least a recognition that there are so many fundamental problems in the planned economies and the Soviet Union's relationship, both with itself, with Eastern Europe and with the Western capitalist world and the United States, that this really was going to demand some far reaching reforms and that these reforms were an expression of failure, not, a, not what's gonna to lead to renewal. And as we finally saw in Eastern Europe in 89 and later on in the USSR in 1991, what it led to was not reform, but effectively collapse. In a way, the, his article ends really on a very dull, rather miserable note, by the way, not a triumphal note, as a number of people have also argued. Um, it actually ends by saying the world's going to become rather boring. It's not going to be a very exciting world. The world of the 20th century, although a bloody, tragic century that it was, was a very exciting century. <laughs> two world wars, one world depression, the rise of fascism, the rise of communism, the Cold War, revolutions in the third world, revolutions in China. It was a century of upheaval. You know, it, it was also led, of course, to, to millions of people dying in, in the process, without doubt. That kind of exciting century, if we can use that kind of terminology to describe such a tragic and bloody century, that was coming to an end. It would be now, as he called it, a rather boring century that we're going to move into. What in the end did he really mean then, just to summarize this, this first part of my presentation? What he meant by the end of history, I think was very specific, very concrete. It meant the end of history with a very big H. He took the very long view. It's, it is actually quite a philosophical article too, I should actually point out. It's, it's, got, it's got empirics there, but it's more philosophical as much philosophical as it is an empirical historical account. Basically he says the world begins, the modern world begins with the French Revolution. It begins with the French Revolution. It is the, the French Revolution in a sense is the beginning of the rise of a series of, of a challenging idea which challenges liberalism. A liberalism largely represented of course through Scottish or English or British political economy of, of the 19th and early parts of the 20th century. And that form of collectivism, which of course gives rise to socialism out of the French Revolution, continues in 1917 with the Russian Revolution, continues on with the Chinese Revolution, the expansion of Soviet power into Eastern Europe, and then revolutions of a Marxist or Marxist-Leninist variety in the Third World. That is what a history has been about, he argues. That's the central core, that's the central dynamic of the historical process. That is what gives meaning to the fundamental of history. That's what he's talking about when he means history. And it is that sense of history, really right, rather going back, not just to the Russian Revolution, but going back to the French Revolution, which in his mind and in his analysis is actually coming to an end. Collectivism in essence is no longer the future. This has been a battle of the futures, not a battle about the past, not how to write the past, but how to write the future, how to construct the future. That was not necessarily an inevitable outcome, he also argues. At certain points in the 20th century, collectivism could have won. 
He actually says by, by, by 1945, with the Soviet Union in control of Eastern Europe, the great victories of the Red Army against fascism, the spread of communist ideas and socialist ideas then to, to the third world, national liberation movements, the Chinese revolution. You might have said in the 1950s or 60s that it's, in a sense, liberalism was losing, not, not, not collectivism. Um, but by the 70s and 80s, he argues, the, if you like, the tide had turned, the economic weaknesses, the political frailties, the systemic problems inherent in the collectivist project were beginning to express themselves and finally represented themselves first, as I said, in the third world, then in Eastern Europe, and of course, two years later in the Soviet Union, and ultimately, of course, in China itself. He even talks of China, the Chinese reforms in his article, by the way, in quite some detail, arguing that Deng Xiaoping's reforms of 78, which were an important part of this change, were the beginnings of this end of history, the movement towards the market and away from central planning. So that's his fundamental notion of what he means by the end of history. It's, it's an interesting article. I think it's very easy to sort of sit back and say, well, the, the guy got it wrong. Of course, history didn't come to an end. Well, if you dismiss it in a very lighthearted fashion, then of course he got it wrong. But if you kind of read the article, which is always a very good thing to do when you're going to discuss anybody else's work, then actually it's a more complicated piece of Piece of, piece of argument, I think, altogether. And it actually does contain, I think, a very simple truth, it's not entirely right, it contains at least one simple point, that if you're looking at the economic struggle between free market enterprise capitalism and its varieties, and there's many varieties of capitalism, after all, there's a European, American, or British form of capitalism, then some kind of market economics was, gonna, was winning, and, and, and ultimately, ultimately triumphed. And I think that's what he broadly speaking, understood to mean the, the end of history. I think in that sense, I don't think he was entirely, entirely wrong. But there are many other things we can talk about and what he did get wrong, but he, I think, got that right. I think what then happened with the idea very quickly is that the, the notion of an end of history was taken to mean a triumph. Whether he intended it like that, I, I, I really don't know. And maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But it was intended to mean a triumph of the West. The future was now laid out for the next thousand years, if you like. Again, he didn't say that, but I think a lot of people took that to mean that. We were now moving into an entirely new history. After all, if, the, if history itself had been the period between the French Revolution of 1789 and 1989, 200 years of history, and that was coming to an end, then it was easy, it was easy enough to suggest that the new history, which was now the end of history as he understood it, would be another 200 years in which liberalism would be triumphant. Again, whether he argued that is another question, but that's certainly, I think, how, how, how he was taken to be understood. And he certainly didn't try and refute some of those arguments either as well. So the market would become dominant. Uh, the market would deliver most of the goods. It would, it would have a downside. He wasn't entirely uncritical of the market. But globalization has, of course, became the dominant theme of much of the writings of the 1980s. The 1990s, rather and beyond, would actually drive all before it. And all ships would be lifted by, by the global economy. I think that was implicit, at least in his argument, it was certainly taken to me. So globalization became part of the narrative of the so-called end of history. The second part of the argument, really, I think, which got taken up in the West was democracy itself. The democracy or liberal democracy or a form of democracy would accompany the market and that again would uh, reinforce the, the, the power of the West and indeed at the heart of it too there is a notion that the West has won. The West has won against the ideological alternatives presented either by Stalinism or some forms of socialism in the 20th century and at least for a period against fascism itself. And I think implicit in that, finally, at the international level, or the global level, I think there was a kind of view, and it was very dominant in the 1990s, and certainly into the early part of the 21st century, that really the United States had won. The United States had won the Cold War, and a new Europe was going to emerge out of the Cold War, a European Union, which whatever its problems and whatever its challenges, again, would drive all, all before it. And that, in a way, is what many took the 1990s to be. People talked of the unipolar moment, they talked of the, the triumph of the West, they talked of the United States as a hyperpower. There was a number of books even written about the European Union saying it would be the 21st century, it would define the 21st century. A good friend of mine, Charlie Cupchin at the Council on Foreign Relations said, actually, 
the future, the future, in fact, is going to be European, not American. You know, that's going to be the 21st century power. And a number of others took that view, again, uh, on this side of the Atlantic and indeed on the other side of the Atlantic as well. So I think that is what it was taken to mean. And of course, with Bill Clinton in the White House, Tony Blair, <coughs> pardon me, Tony Blair, the Prime Minister of Great Britain at the time, you know, with a kind of liberal... A liberal triumphalism, in a sense, became very prevalent, I think, in the 1990s. Now, of course, this ignored some pretty dark spots within the world. What was happening in Yugoslavia and the collapse of Yugoslavia <coughs> hardly looked like the, the triumph of liberalism. Indeed, what was even happening in the former USSR and Russia, in Chechnya, hardly looked like uh, the triumph of liberalism. And what was happening in a number of states in the 1990s, including Afghanistan, hardly looked like the triumph of liberalism or even the end of history in any meaningful sense at all. But nonetheless, that is, I think, what was taken to mean. Which leads me then to the question, what has gone wrong? Why today, 20 years after the turn of the century, 30 years more or less, 30 years more or less, since when he wrote the article, what, what is it that people believe has gone wrong? Because clearly something has. I mean, we could start with COVID and say what COVID has illustrated is the failure of liberalism or the failure of liberal economics. You, you could argue that point, and I think there's something to be said about that. Anglo-America has not done very well in the COVID crisis, let's be clear. But I think what is meant is something deeper and, and longer in, in terms of its uh, gestation and in terms of its impact. And I, I put it into, I put it into f four categories very quickly. One that liberalism itself was challenged by 9-11. I think if you look at the literature, you go back, it, all, it does go back to 2001. If you like, the beginning of the end, or the end of the end of history, in the, in the sense that some had interpreted Fukuyama to mean, I think 9-11, the ideology, the ideas that drove the bombers, the suicide bombers, Al-Qaeda and others subsequently, that, I think, is also seen as pointing out pretty damn clearly, or very clearly, that ideologically not everybody is in the world has bought into a, a, a liberal narrative about the world, pretty obviously. Um, now, that gets you into a much more complicated area of the difference between jihad and terrorism, not just Islam alone. You know, it's a larger debate to be had. But nonetheless, I think what happened in 9-11 was interpreted by many to say, Actually, there are many millions of people in the world. They may not even be supporting 9-11, but there are many millions of people in the world who don't simply buy into what you might call a liberal point of view, who don't buy into the notion of human rights, may not buy into the notion of what becomes gay rights, or, you know, tr transgender relations, buys into the notion of everybody can have an opinion, etc., 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 etc. So I think that began to chip away at the self-confidence of the West. I think 9-11 did enormous damage to the self-confidence of the West. And what was then followed by an Iraq war made that, undermine that self-confidence uh, e even more, I think. I think secondly, liberalism has been challenged in, in an old fashioned power sense by, by new illiberal powers. You know, not every power in the world today or even then, you know, signed up to what you might call a liberal agenda. Uh, Russia went through a certain transition in the 1990s under Boris Yeltsin, but under Putin that clearly has changed. The economic situation has changed, the political situation has changed, and nobody I think would suggest that Putin was a liberal. Indeed, he's constructed a whole ideology which is illiberal. His whole notion of a sovereign democracy in Russia, his whole notion of what is, what, what is Russian society and what should it be, does not actually argue for, for liberalism, as, as, as one has seen over the last few years, and not just with the invasion of Ukraine or what's happening with Navalny, but going back. And actually, Putin has constructed a fairly coherent illiberal ideology of, of sovereignty, of, of what, he, what he'd almost regard as we are not liberal. And this has certainly had an impact in, in certain many countries in the world, including places like Hungary and Poland, which I think Michael might talk about. And of course, then there's Russia. And then, of course, there's China. China, again, may have bought into liberal economics. It may have joined the World Trade Organization. It may have become the largest market in the world. It may have become the most important place to go and invest your money if you're an American corporation. And no doubt there was a belief by some liberals 
that China would evolve economically, then would become integrated into the world economy, would become a stakeholder, and to use the phrase of Bill Clinton, and also, by the way, George W. Bush, China would become like us. You know, trade will open them up. Long-term trade, long-term investment, long-term integration of China into the capitalist world economy, more and more of that would make them stakeholders and would gradually see reform within China. I don't think anybody said it's going to happen straight away, uh, but nonetheless, I think there was this liberal evolutionist argument that that would happen in China. And quite clearly, seeing the election, the elevation of Deng Xiao, of, of uh, Xi Jinping, looking at what's been happening in China uh, since 2015, what's happening today inside China, whether in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, or domestically, this has clearly not happened. And that has been represented, this, this kind of rise of illiberal powers, which may actually have some formal democratic structures, as in Russia, but these rise of illiberal powers again has challenged the whole notion of, of liberal triumphalism. And finally, I think on the economic side, and I think the first economist to really get this right, and I, I've always been a great, I've always banged the drum for Danny Roderick, who I think as a political economist rather than a narrow technical economist, Nothing, nothing against technical economists, but I think Danny Roderick as a political economist, I think made a major, major step forward in the analysis of globalization in 1997. You know, he started talking very openly about the downsides of globalization and free trade and free markets. But what might be good for capital, what might be good for the corporations, what might be good for generating wealth globally and growth globally, which it did, there's no doubt about it. We, the world as a whole got wealthier as a result of globalization for a period of time, no doubt about that. And Clinton jumped on that bandwagon and pushed it along as much as possible. But there was a dark underside of that, of that which meant job losses, growing inequality, uh, the loss of manufacture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And much of that, of course, which Danny started talking, Danny Roderick started talking about in 1997 about globalization, began to manifest itself more and more in the 2000s it manifested itself with a vengeance in 2008 with the great financial crash. And then, of course, manifested itself again. And I'm sure Michael will say more about this with the rise of populism in, in, as we've seen as a political phenomenon within the West over the last over the last few years, both in the United States with Trump in this country, I think, uh, with Brexit, and of course, in a number of countries in East Central Europe and, and, and elsewhere. I think the final point I'd make, and this is a point which comes from uh, one of, I think, one of the most influential writers in international relations, although whether you agree with him is another question, is John Mearsheimer. John Mearsheimer is a structural realist. He's never abandoned his realism in, in 40 years of writing about the world. He always argued that the world is basically a very competitive, almost a Darwinian place, and that the rise of China would challenge the power of the United States. And therefore, one should not believe into this liberal argument that China will buy into the liberal order. He always said that was nonsense. In the end, China as a rising power would challenge the power of the United States. And in some, in some regards, I think, if one is saying who got it right, the, the liberal integrationist or Mearsheimer, well, I think at the moment that the ball is very much in Mearsheimer's court. But he also made another point, which others have argued, that there was a kind of a foreign policy triumphalism in the 1990s which was uh, expressed, I suppose, through Blair, was expressed through uh, Clinton to some degree, certainly was expressed by George W. Bush. But basically, as good liberals, you wanted to make everybody else into a liberal. <laughs> you wanted to promote liberalism. You wanted to promote democracy. You wanted to change other societies and make your, those societies which were less liberal like you. And he believes that this was hubris of the worst order. But what the, the great Western powers should have done, America in particular, should have been much more modest, should have been altogether much more cautious. And the opposite happened in the 1990s and beyond. And that was infused, he believes, by a kind of an underlying liberalism, a belief that you, you can shift and change the world in a direction which you want and favours you. Um, just to give one example on that, not just the promotion of econ economic arguments, about the market, that was one thing, but also the promotion of Western institutions such as NATO. Mir Scheinberg would argue that essentially the promotion of NATO, NATO enlargement, like EU enlargement again, was in a sense uh, an expression of a kind of a, a liberal optimism, a liberal triumphalism. And in the end, what that did 
was essentially to push Ru Russia into a corner and Russia, in a sense, has pushed back against that. That's how he would interpret that. Thus, even NATO and EU expansion, which takes as being not exactly one and the same thing, but I, at least connected, has again led to, to a, a pushback against liberalism. And we are now paying the price of that kind of liberal that liberal triumphalism, that liberal hubris. So I'll leave it there with those, the, that, that remark, building on what Mearsheimer has said. I think there's no question, however we understand uh, Francis Fukuyama's early argument, there was an, a, a certain, a distinct optimism about the future. The future would be liberal. And there are many today who are now asking the question, is that moment over and are we again at the end of the end of history? So with those few last comments, I'll pass over to Michael, Michael Burley to continue the conversation. Michael, over to you. Is that okay? Good. Um, first of all, I just want to um, briefly um, thank um, Nikolai and Imre Ratu for making all of this possible. I think we should um, uh, express our gratitude for that. And of course, Mick for such a fluent um, introduction. I have to say, um, when he mentioned Fukuyama predicting a boring future, I've become deeply nostalgic for a boring future after what we've been living through in the last decade. <laughs> In fact, it reminds me of, a, I think it was in Romania, that I saw an electoral, electoral slogan recently, which, uh, which was fantastic. It said, make, make Romania a normal country again. Well, there's plenty of other countries I can think of, including this one, which might want to use that as a slogan. Anyway, I just want to, um, in a way, go on from uh, where Mick left off um, by describing what you might call the evolution of a political ecosystem after uh, the brief uh, unipolar moment, which I guess petered out somewhere in the deserts of Iraq in 2004. Um, the end of the Cold War, first of all, dissolved the cross-party Western anti-communist consensus and led to a managerial centrism in which technocratic politicians uh, shared power with often unelected international technocratic agencies and uh, their own unelected central bankers. Moreover, a Western economic um, model, which had taken a long time to evolve and was not f flawless, was simply transposed onto other countries um, in Eastern Europe, Central Europe and uh, uh, Russia, um, with on the whole catastrophic um, uh, effects certainly in Russia. Um, and this was just imposed on them by uh, hubristic Western technocrats. Um, these elites in turn imposed uh, globalized production and supply chains on populations who very quickly divided, um, remarkably quickly divided into winners and losers, which you can uh, read about in a rather good book by a French um, historical geographer, uh, Christophe Guilly, there it is, La France Périphérique, uh, which describes that process in one country where sort of basically 20 odd towns do extremely, or cities do extremely well out of globalization and nobody else does. Um, the 2008 financial crisis and the subsequent Eurozone crisis, which I can well remember, accelerated um, uh, income and wealth inequalities with young people having their futures destroyed um, in, among other countries, Italy, Spain, and particularly Greece. Um, and in fact, um, many young people found themselves literally being re-ruralized. In other words, the, the historic shift, the secular shift of populations into cities from the countryside was in a way put in reverse. And off they went back to the countryside because of course in countries like that, there's sort of uh, widespread own ownership of uh, rural property. And then two generations found themselves living on the pension of the grandparents. And I've certainly know, for example, Spanish journalists who had to move out of Madrid when they were made redundant and off they went back to live with their parents. These are people in their fifties. Uh, the second point I want to make is uh, in a way an obvious one, which is that austerity which of course was crushing in places like Latvia, leading to wholesale 
emigration by young people at one point. Uh, austerity was for everyone other than the architects of these financial crises. And that, of course, explains the thing I really, that which underlies what I've got to say, which is the moral outrage and the fact that so many people are incredibly angry and remain angry. And in fact, there's another book I want to hold up. One of, uh, one of the authors is a friend of mine, Eric Lonergan, uh, Mark Blythe, called Angrynomics, which I strongly recommend to you because it's one of the few books which I've read recently which try to look at economics and emotions like anger. Uh, but there's another thing we should also note, which is often rather underplayed in the literature on populism, particularly uh, the literature which deprecates populism, which is that elites uh, across Europe and elsewhere largely destroyed their own credibility. Mick uh, briefly mentioned the Iraq war, and of course we in Britain think of all the lies that were told to justify it. But every European country, uh, Italy at an early stage with Tangentopoli um, has had corruption scandals. Here we had the famous 2009 Duck House parliamentary expenses scandal where they were basically most of them were revealed to be on the take. Or of course, um, you know, if you read Spanish newspapers, there's the bipartisan corruption of both the socialists and the conservatives in Spain, which is almost seems en uh, endemic. Now parallel, and this is um, a slightly separate point, but I think a vital one, parallel with this, the discrediting by the elites of their own order, the growth of minority identity politics, in other words, you know, gay rights, um, ethnic minority rights, etc, 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 eventually duly led majorities to reconstrue themselves as another voiceless victim group. And there are some very good books about populism in the United States which show exactly how that happened, that all the things you associate with uh, put upon uh, minorities were adopted by um, the biggest uh, population group of all, in fact, the majority, um, who construed themselves as being this voiceless group, although they were um, overwhelmingly white, of course, and their views were generously represented, should I say, in most of the right-wing press. So they weren't exactly voiceless, but never mind, they thought they were, and that they were being stifled, that they were being stopped from having their voices heard. Now, of course, across Europe, the 2015-16 migration crisis proved the final fire accelerant, as it were, in the crisis I'm describing. Though obviously populist and neo-fascist parties existed long before that. I mean, if you think of the Front National in France, it goes back to the early 1970s, 1972, I think. Uh, and one of the reasons why they suddenly flourished was because many conservative parties, mainstream centre-right parties, which hitherto had blocked, checked the emergence of parties to the right of them, no longer uh, did so, often for quite instrumental reasons. So we duly then saw an explosion of political parties catering to the angry so-called voiceless. Some of them are in power, especially where, like Hungary, there's been a significant loss of young people, um, you know, through emigration. Or Poland, where, and I'm sure there are Polish people listening to me, where what is called Polska B feels neglected by Polska A. So, you know, a city like Warsaw or Poznań, these are thriving, dynamic places with the latest uh, industries, but then move out into the countryside, the more religious countryside, by the way, and it's not like that. Um, in my country, uh, because it certainly hasn't been exempt uh, from any of this, uh, the angry people, as it were, tend to be in deindustrialized de uh, northern towns and the decayed coastal towns in particular. Though it's worth pointing out, talking of Brexit, that just factually speaking, most of the people who voted for it were pretty wealthy southerners and that, you know, the number of people who voted remain, say, in Liverpool, was, exact, was slightly more actually than the number of people who voted in London, although 30% of Londoners actually voted for Brexit. Now, the next point I want to come on to is the nature of the anger. Unless you suffer um, from road, I don't drive, so I can't have road rage, or trolley rage, 
I have trolley rage, I'll admit that. Um, anger on the whole tends to be evanescent, it's a passing thing. We can't go around being angry all the time, or at least most of us don't. But in this case, the anger was made permanent through the malign activities of sundry elite tribunes of the angry people, if you like Latter-day Brutuses and Coriolanuses, who use the latest media technologies to keep the pot at boiling point. Now, apart from what on the whole in Britain is a disgusting tabloid press, I'd especially blame talk radio, and in fact, another book I'm gonna hold up, which is actually quite brilliant, which is an analysis of talk radio and its malign effects in the United States of America. It's a really interesting read, um, if you're not familiar with that subject. Um, so talk radio, whose hosts, this is an important point, like Sean Hannity, crossed over to become the people who chaired the meetings which selected Republican candidates, political candidates. And we've had that in Britain as well, where someone like Ian Dale, who's a talk radio host, was involved in selecting British conservative candidates. So there's a sort of fluid interaction. Um, and then last but not least, of course, I'm sure um, the more tech savvy of you or people more tech savvy than me know a lot more than I do about the way in which the internet has lent itself to the dissemination of malign lies. There's book after book on that. Now, of course, the real joke about this, about the tribunes of the people, is that most of them are actually elite figures. I mean, uh, Matteo Salvini comes from a very well-heeled uh, Milanese business family. Um, Nigel Farage is an ex-metal uh, city metals trader. And last but not least, um, a particular bugbear of mine, the Duchess of Oldenburg, um, uh, Duchess Beatrix von Storch, who's one of the leaders of the German Alternative für Deutschland. Well, as I said, she's the Duchess of Oldenburg and the granddaughter of Hitler's last finance minister, I think. Um, rather than acting as a break, and this is the next point I want to come on to, rather than being a break on populism, many conservative parties open their gates to it. The worst examples uh, being the US Republicans, who have virtually abandoned their entire identity to become a sort of Trumpist party. And of course, the British Conservatives, who nowadays are basically an anarchic mob. Um, and like other populists across Europe, they see themselves at war, as Mick was alluding to, with liberalism. And of course, the EU is... Um, transformed into the ultimate bastion of liberalism and then caricatured by many populists as a fourth reich or the eu ssr and so forth rather than being a voluntary association of free sovereign nation states um, we should also note that along the way the populists and this does show the distance they've traveled from conventional cons traditional conservatism that they show a nihilistic contempt for the institutional fabric of our societies. Uh, for example, they are totally contemptuous and actually would like to displace a neutral civil service. Um, they uh, attack the independence of the uh, judiciary. In Britain, the Daily Mail had a front page uh, with the faces of three Supreme Court judges uh, and the headline, Enemies of the People. And uh, the monopolistic media um, relentlessly, in many places, puts itself behind um, these uh, uh, parties, or at least um, puts itself behind the views which they espouse, which in turn um, nudges, as it were, conventional conservatives in that direction. And this presents other people, uh, like us, with a whole series, if you can have more than one, Rubicons, because we have to decide, and it's a very delicate decision, especially if you're a conservative, at what point do you rebel, do you reject these successive moves into this new, new type of politics, which after all is also a form of temptation. And, uh, you know, ultimately it will lead, as we've seen in many countries, Hungary is one, Poland is another. I regret to say that my country is well on the way to this. You'll end up with the adoption of a sort of um, Schmittian 
uh, way of conducting politics, i.e. The, the Nazi philosopher Carl Schmitt, where you divide people into friends and foes in, in the hope of um, consolidating and mobilising, firing up your base. I mean, Trump is a very good example of somebody doing that. And we um, have it going on here in Britain too. There's a very good book, by the way, which I read years and years ago by Fritz Stern, who I used to know, long dead, called The Politics of Cultural Despair, which is about a series of right-wing ideologists, I think including Schmidt in the Weimar Republic, and how that became a kind of temptation for conservatives to um, cross particular boundaries. Now, just to wrap up, um, perhaps on a more positive note, Mick mentioned um, COVID, which of course is all in, in our thoughts. And I would say that one result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I mean, not everything about COVID has been necessarily bad. I mean, for example, I read a very interesting piece the other day about how parents have got more involved in the education of their children because they have to participate with it online. In India, you know, little kids are asked to count, count their parents' teeth or, and then count their grandparents' teeth to teach them sort of basic uh, numeracy. Anyway, I digress. Um, COVID has undoubtedly put a huge question mark over um, how populist governments from Bolsonaro via Trump to uh, Boris Johnson to Modi, et cetera, et cetera, have uh, dealt with um, uh, the pandemic. And in many cases, they've been exposed as sort of liabilities rather than anything useful because, of course, they uh, detest uh, scientific expertise. In fact, they detest, they reject expertise in general. So in a sense, this may have um, given a boost to uh, people who actually know something. And uh, this has been translated into political effects. I mean, I, uh, the Bertelsmann Stiftung in Germany does regular um, surveys of uh, the, the rise and fall of populist attitudes. And at least among the German population, there's been a decline uh, since COVID uh, from people having that sort of mindset from 33% down to 20. And you can also see that in the way that the AFD is in all sorts of crises. And in fact, some of them are rejoining the Conservatives and others, of course, are spiralling out into a more explicitly neo-Nazi um, setup. And what this crisis has shown is that the ability to craft sound bites is in fact no substitute for deep expertise in science, health economics, etc., etc. However, because like Fukuyama, I'm a bit of a miserableist, um, if the economic scarring of the pandemic becomes long term and the European Union is actually is spending 750 billion euros to mitigate it in its recovery fund, if it becomes long term, then we might see that partly because the populists, the earlier populists have now become basically the mainstream, they're actually in coalition governments, they're in parliaments, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. You might see the rise of other populists uh, beyond the existing populists and they could be extremely dangerous because it's in the nature of things to, as the AFD shows very clearly, to become more extreme. Now I'm not somebody who likes uh, comparisons with the 1920s and the 1930s. I spent most of my life studying that, um, partly because we don't, we haven't just emerged from a world war and we don't have paramilitary formations marching up and down the streets. But, um, you know, that would be, that would be the point at which I would start to see things which are very, very like um, what happened in the 1930s. However, being an optimist, I think that really um, the centre will hold and uh, that, you know, things will, um, they won't get back to normal because there's no going back to normal, but um, maybe uh, democracy will limp along because the alternatives are pretty dreadful. Uh, the last thing I'd say, by the way, which to come back to my uh, underlying theme, which is anger, that um, a few years ago, some Israeli sociologists did a very interesting experiment where they, they took a suburb of Tel Aviv, which was full of sort of quasi-fascists, I mean, real, real sort of Likudniks or worse. And they decided rather than to challenge anything they said or thought, they saturated the place with um, social media slogans saying, you know, the IDF, the Israeli Defence Force are the best in the world. You know, the only good Arab is a dead one sort of thing. Well, not quite that, but pretty near it. 
this went on for a year and at the end of this um, uh, experiment on a large scale they were quite surprised to see that if you actually held up a mirror like a distorting mirror in a fairground or a circus and people could really see what they looked like and what they sounded like for long enough then there was a decline and their views actually tempered and became more moderate so i'll just leave you with that sort of little sociological experiment well actually it was quite a big one as food for thought thank you very much okay thanks very much michael before we, we go to the questions which are beginning to come up in large numbers thank you very much to the audience a very good and large audience it is too <clears throat> i just make one one or two points michael if you want to come back against or yeah. talk to me about anything i may have said as well it might be useful not to monopolize it but just to make a couple of points yeah. i think one of the things i i i derive and we've got to talk about covid because it's difficult not to I mean, after all, we're moving up to a million dead. And uh, the United States, by the way, will have something close to 220,000 dead by the time of the November e elections. Uh, a huge figure, given the size of the United States. Yeah. But populists have not had a, maybe not, I'm putting this rather crudely, but populists have not had a good COVID, have they? I mean, if, no. you, if you look at the united states if you look at brazil you know if you look at a number of other countries modi modi in india yeah you know i mean all those who have talked up we are representing the people who have been anti-scientific anti-expert yeah. yeah. dare i even say in the case of many some in the united states anti-science we've yeah. even had this extraordinary situation where trump says one thing and some of the extraordinarily good scientists he's got around him, like Dr. Tony Fauci, who's become one of my heroes over the last year, you know, virtually ignored or sit there looking deeply embarrassed. So if there's optimism again, Michael, I'd just like to get your thoughts on this. Is the optimism also all know that COVID will show up the pop populism in, in ways that nothing else could have done, rather, rather tragically. That's my first point. The second point, and, and you did hint at it, I do think liberals in, in general have been rather sneery towards populists, uh, holding their nose up as if there's some smell under it. If you remember, Mrs. Clinton talked of Trump's deplorables. deplorables. Yeah. And I, I think although we may have grave reservations about populism and what yeah. it leads to and the things it can't achieve as opposed to what it claims to do and, and the dangers it represents, which you talked about, we do really have to understand where it's come from because we don't really understand where it's come from. We're not going to understand how we can address the fundamental causes of a political phenomenon such as populism. Would you like to comment on both those points, maybe, Michael, and then we'll pick up some other questions from the audience. I mean, the, inco the incompetence of populist leaders, I mean, for me, was, um, well, first of all, Trump, Trump and the rest of them didn't really think it was very serious. And then, uh, you know, he's regularly come out with uh, suggestions that people drink bleach and stuff like that. I mm, mean, mm. This the actions of an irresponsible lunatic. Um, on your second point, I would just elaborate mm. with uh, one example. If you take the yellow vest uh, protests in France, which um, I think were originally um, triggered by the fact that people in the countryside do a lot more driving than people in towns. I mean, many people in towns don't even bother driving anymore. They do car sharing or uber um and these people were being told by the central french government you know that oh well there's going to be taxes on diesel diesel fuel fuel vehicles in order having encouraged them to buy them uh to um you know cut down on emissions etc etc now if i was somebody who had to make a 15 10 20 mile journey every time i wanted to buy a bottle of milk or to take my child to school i would be pretty angry about um people um telling me you know that i couldn't couldn't have this car or that i should buy an electric car although of course it would cost a small fortune and i couldn't afford it you know I mean, that's the sort of thing where you should you should listen to them on the other hand um this might be slightly controversial but um as as somebody like you who's lived the life of the mind for a very long time I really don't feel obliged to adopt a type of cultural cringe to outright morons. 
<laughs> I mean, people who deny climate climate change or who are anti-vaccine or all the rest of it, or who say, oh, it's the foreigns, isn't it? You know, it's them Poles or Romanians yeah. or whatever. I mean, I do not feel the slightest, uh, yeah. and I won't, um, uh, sympathy or, um, you know, because I know that, that the the migrants are actually nothing to do with their particular economic plight. Those questions are to do with bad distribution of wealth and equality within my own country. It's nothing to do with or our country. It's nothing to do with them. So I really don't uh, go for this type of cultural cringe. Oh, we've got to sort of understand them because at some point there is nothing to understand. You're either faced with stupidity or, you know, self-denial. Mm -hmm. Okay, Michael, I'm going to hand over to Dave, who's got to, uh some questions lined up on, on the chat line. Dave, over to you. Hi, yeah, we've got, uh, so this is an amalgamation of Madeleine Muckens um, from the political science department in Cluj, and uh, also uh, Ekaterina Dimitrova. Um, they ask, you know, condensed into one question, what do you think the outcome of a contested US election will be for the rest of the world? And will a second <laughs> term for Trump boost authoritarian well. leaders like Erdogan <laughs> and Putin? Well, I think both Michael and I will have quite a lot to say on that. Um, why don't I kick off, Michael, and yeah. stop me after half an hour. Um, <laughs> You're the Americanist. Well, I, I've been talking about this now for at least a week, and uh, I'm yeah. doing, now reviewing some books, as you know. The ex mm. One of the things that Trump has done, if I can just get on to that, what Trump has done is a major boost to the publishing industry. I mean, there's never, I mean, three times more books are coming out on Trump than ever came out on uh, Barack Obama. And these books sell it in their millions, or at least in the high hundreds of thousands. The, whatever Trump has done, the one thing he has done is kind of generate enormous interest in the world about the United States, and certainly generate such interest in him. And I'm not surprising that the first question we get really is about the United States and Trump, and whether he's going to win, can he win? And what will happen if he does win, both in the United States and, and abroad? Moreover, will he accept defeat, which is another big question. And I, as, as I think many of you now know out there, Trump has already made it pretty clear that if he loses, he's going to contest it in one way or another. The whole question of the, the, the ballots, the, the postal ballots, fake news. I mean, one of the most dangerous moments we're going to face after November is either a close election or an election, even if it's not close, that Trump is going to contest. And it could get very dangerous and nasty indeed. Uh, Michael talked about violence uh, on the streets, and I would not say that it's impossible because we have seen a lot of armed groups involved over the last year, Michael, have we not? Yeah. Across the United States, and the, they could easily be mobilized. And I'm not talking civil war. We're not in a period just before the beginning of the American Civil War. But I, I have, I, 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 like many other people who keep a close eye on things in the United States, a, bit, a very worrying eye, I must say, increasingly, would worry first and foremost that if Trump were to lose or, would, or Biden was only to win by a margin, whatever that margin would be, it is going to lead almost inevitably, it seems to me, into a constitutional crisis, which could spill out onto the streets. And I think this is extremely worrying and extremely dangerous. Uh, and therefore, I think we've got to keep that in mind. This is not a normal America any longer. And there are two reasons why it's become abnormal, or maybe several reasons, but there's two reasons fundamentally. Firstly, COVID itself has made America increasingly angry. You know, I mean, you've got on one side the right wing saying there's no COVID. There's nothing to be worried about. It's all fake news, which is extremely interesting. And on the other side, you have those who believe that, in essence, Trump is really a fundamental threat to American democracy. So you've, you've got a situation in America caused by, well, precipitated and made worse by the COVID crisis in which you have a president in the White House who is well prepared, more than happy, well, at least more than willing, you know, to mobilize any kind of, of form of opposition to what the outcome might be if Biden were to win and were to win only by a margin or if he were to lose and only by a margin. And even if he won by a large, even if Biden won by a large majority, I still feel Trump is going to contest this 
election with all the consequences that follow from it. I'm, I'm not saying this just, to, you know, to, for the soundbite, but I, I, I'm seriously worried and seriously concerned about what might happen. Now, it's up to Biden to lose it, basically, at the moment. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you. He's got a 10-point lead, but we know what happened in 2016. Um, I, I think, on balance, he's a stronger candidate than Mrs. Clinton, although she won 3 million more votes. Nonetheless, I do think he's going to appeal across a wider range. I think he's going to mobilise people that Mrs. Clinton was less successful at mobilising in 2016. I think he's a he'll, he might turn out also to be a tougher candidate. I don't know. And he's also chosen a very, he's made a very shrewd move on his vice president as well which I find, I find very reassuring as well. All the indicators are is that Biden must win by a large majority. You know, if you look at the key states, the, the six or seven swing states, he's ahead. You don't have, but he could lose it by a margin and then could lose the whole thing because of the electoral college system in the United States. It's all to play for still. However far ahead he may be in the polls, it's still very uncertain. Trump should lose by a massive majority, given the COVID crisis, given the downturn in the economy. The, the, the situation, however, is, and Michael hinted at it, 42% of Americans believe that Trump is right. It doesn't matter what he does. It doesn't matter what he says about women. It doesn't matter what he says about race. In fact, what he says about race may mobilize his base. He's got a very strong, fundamentally loyal base who will come out for him and they won't move. His problem is he, he's got to move beyond that base. Biden's problem is he mustn't, in a sense, muck up the, the, the campaign. Uh, and if he doesn't do that, he will get, I think, to a very, very strong majority and hopefully carry both houses as well, at least from Biden's point of view. If Trump were, however, to win, let me just put it like that. Let's just say he wins, in a, in, as he did in 2016, not with a majority. Let's just say for a moment he wins. I think the consequences are very serious as well. I do. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't want to kind of jump onto the normal anti-Trump bandwagon, or perhaps I should be. Uh, but I think if he were to win, the consequences, I think, are going to be very, very serious indeed. I think every dictator in the world, every authoritarian leader in the world would be deeply happy if Trump were, were to win. I think European Democrats and Democrats around the world, those who believe in human rights, sh should be and will be very, very unhappy if he were to win. Uh, so I, I, it, it, it's a very dangerous, volatile situation in the United States. This is going to be, and I think Trump is right at least on one thing, this is going to be the most serious, important election that we've seen in, in my lifetime, at least. Michael? Um, well, uh, I'm not so sure that there's going to be a Biden landslide. Um, one of the obstacles he's going to face just at the end of this month is the first of three television debates, and he's up against... Um, yeah. somebody whose um, latter part of his life has been spent on television and who can use that medium uh, pretty effectively. Um, the other thing, I, I suspect it will be quite a tight outcome um, and that then hundreds of lawyers on either side will move in to relitigate it for a long time. And at that point, uh, the idea will spread around what I call the fatties with firearms, that the election has been stolen from Trump and then they could uh, get very nasty indeed. I certainly think that, I'm sure, I know that was fatism, but never mind. Um, the, uh, the key thing uh, I wonder about Biden, I mean, there are some quite good, I mean, Kamala Harris was, was a, an excellent choice, as you said, Mick, as uh, vice president. And then he's also been much more receptive in the policy study groups to, to uh, the um, suggestions of Sanders and um, Warren and so on than I thought he would be. He's a bit less centrist than I thought. It remains to be seen what, what his foreign policy team, what they'll be doing to correct his otherwise rather conventional views on foreign policy. But the big, the big um, uh, question mark hanging over him is that America is, is an and I have lived there for three years, is an incredibly polarized society. I've never seen it divided like this in my adult lifetime. And the, what it cries out for is a kind of German style, or to a lesser extent, Japanese style, Vergangenheit, Bewältigung, you know, sort of coming to terms with its past, which they have infinitely deferred. 
and it goes way beyond taking down a few statues or renaming army bases. There's a deep process of sort of healing that would have to happen for some of these divisions to go away. And I wonder whether Biden, who will doubtless, he will repair America's damaged relations with, with their allies, whether it's South Korea or um, particularly Germany and the European Union. Uh, he will rejoin the Iran deal, which recklessly Trump tried to sabotage and he will presumably rejoin the Paris climate change agreement. So all those things are mm. very good from our perspective mm. in Europe. So those are my thoughts on it. The other thing, if I could just jump in there, one of the things we didn't mention, uh, two other things that Trump will bang the drum on. And I, I'm with you actually, I, I, I think is going to be very close. I'm simply yeah. hoping, I suppose, for yeah. Biden to get so, so many more votes and it's not even going to be challengeable. You know, he's, he's going to sweep the House and the Senate and get a big majority. So you get to the point where it's impossible to say it's been stolen. That's, I'm simply hoping. Yeah. Uh, I, but I, like you, I, I retain a very strong sense that it may not be like that. And, and the campaign and the debates themselves, as you pointed out, could certainly work to Trump's favour. Let's be honest, Trump is the most media savvy president I think I've ever seen. Mm. Um, you know, he, he plays it to perfection to his own advantage and, and in ways which are very damaging to the fabric of American uh, democracy. So I'm, 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 I'm extremely worried about, about that. The, and Trump could win. I mean, I just get back to this. I mean, we can't rule that possibility out. We can't rule that possibility out. The consequences, however, as you say, of a Biden victory, if they were to be, I know a lot of people have said if he wins, well, it won't make much difference on the US-China relationship. And I know a lot, we've got a question coming up on that. But I kind of think that the, it's going to be like a, a massive decompression for many people around the world, whether it's going to be one inside the United States. Uh, the, you know, Trump has so dominated the, the, the scene and, and has so undermined American soft power. There was a recent report out this morning, the Pew Report, which shows the decline of, of press, America's prestige in the world, not only in places in the world where they've not, never been very popular, but in countries in the world where they've basically been regarded as friends and allies. And that would actually have a very, very big impact. But as, as a, I think the question suggests, you know, we're heading to some very, very turbulent waters indeed. Dave? Uh, okay, yes, so we have a question from Ben Hales, I hope this is the question you were referring to. Um, you've spoken mainly about, about the right, and of course the populism is both left and right. Do you think that the left is mounting a viable challenge to liberalism, considering how much this year is um, being compared to 1968 with reference to protest and social mm. ferment? Uh, do you want to have a go first, Michael? I, I'll, I'll follow up. Yeah, okay. Um, gosh, 1968. Oh. Those are the days. <laughs> uh, I think this is, um, let's put it this way, it's a sort of opportunity that the, the, the uh, pandemic has um, created an opportunity to fundamentally uh, rethink certain things like um, our sort of mindless consumption, uh, the way in which we've um, allowed allowed technologies to take over large parts of our working day. I mean, the other day I had to put my, my iPhone back to factory settings and I spent the whole of the next day recu recovering the apps and all the rest of it on my phone. So that's a, a working day because, um, I, you know, my life is dominated by technology. Um, I think that there is the potential to um, alter the way in which we work, where we work, how we work. Um, of course, Nick and I are... Um, you know we're we're rich baby boomers but uh, so we've got nice houses with lots of space i mean i guess if i was sitting in a one room bed sit with my laptop i wouldn't be so enthused about working at home but um you know if a lot of people have discovered the positive benefits of working at home and actually the point i alluded to earlier on about parents being able to actually participate in the education of their children is a surprisingly uh, important one so uh, whether this does result in the left um, uh, seizing this opportunity to um, take the lead in how our societies might um, emerge in better shape after the pandemic, which is what I'd rather hope they would, mm. whether they just continue to plough 
various kinds of predictable furrows, you know, getting worked up about various issues, which actually a lot of people couldn't give a damn about. And that isn't to say that one's hostile to them. It's just, you don't give a damn. <laughs> Uh, whether that can happen, of course, uh, is not really for me to say. But I would, I would say that. Um, I mean, look, the, the pop. One, you know, I've read dozens and dozens of articles about the decline of European social democracy and classic Labour parties, which is to do with the the decline of trade union membership and uh, you know, atomistic consumerism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm Fukuyama actually to, to mention, go back to him a couple of years ago. I, I too met Fukuyama and, uh, this was when he was plugging his new book, which was claiming that class-based politics had been replaced entirely by identity politics. And I listened to him talking. He's rather gentle sort of Japanese American, nice man. Uh, but I began to think, you know, well, hang on here a moment. One major economic crisis, you know, which really busts up people's um, uh, existences and futures, and uh, they'll be a lot more interested in economics than in identity when that happens. And I did think that listening to him. Oh. My take on my answer to your question is twofold. Look, it seems to me there's absolutely no doubt. I've got to be careful if I say there's no doubt. It looks from every poll that we've looked at in America over the last two to three years. And this also helps us explain the Bernie Sanders phenomenon. Bernie doesn't come out of nowhere. You know, he, I mean, you know, he's the, well, he's the only person in the United States today, the presidential candidate originally, you know, who calls himself a socialist. And, you know, 30 years ago, that would have been persona non grata. That would have been him finished. And he's not finished today. And indeed, and as I think Michael hinted, I mean, Joe Biden is going to have to take very careful stock yeah. of the support given to Bernie Sanders in ways that Mrs. Clinton did not. Yeah. And that was one of the weaknesses of her campaign. Whereas I think uh, Biden, I think, is going to be very cautious and very careful and will reach out to that left, represented partly by his own vice president, but more importantly by people like, like uh, Elizabeth Warren and also by Bernie Sanders. And that does tell <laughs> something about the changing... The changing political mood inside the United States as well. It's so, in a way, Michael talked about the polarization, and this is part of the polarization which is taking place. I mean, it's not like the trenches of the 30s in Europe, Michael, is it? No, nobody to go over to five year plans and start walk, walking behind the party of the United States of America. But there is clearly, however ill defined and however incoherent, and maybe it's defined as much around identity politics as class politics, there's no doubt just looking. And all the various websites, talking to various people, and I know a lot of friends over there, not all of them left wing, there's no doubt there's a shift in mood. There's a shift in mood. And we see polls today which say that 40% of young Americans, many of whom have been hit very badly, not only by the COVID crisis, but by 2008. These are the young people getting an education who can't find a decent job. It's also a lot of young working class guys in the United States, white and black. And black and black and black young working class guys as well. There's clearly a, there's clearly a mood out there. There's clearly a mood out there, a radical mood out there. And of course, Trump is trying to play on that. You know, the, the, this notion of a left wing threat. And I don't. Okay, he's exaggerating it and he's making much of this up. But nonetheless, it it it, it does tap into something which I think has become real in the United States, which was not there, I think, a few few years ago. The other way in which there might be a shift to the left, or could be is, of course, what's happening in terms of the response to the COVID crisis. The market is not a solution to the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. you know, throughout the Western world, and even in the United States, the state government, government policies, state policies, have had to come in with the COVID crisis. In other words, rather than kind of neoliberal markets will solve all your problems approach, we found in the COVID crisis that those parts of the world which have had more state, more government, more direction, if you like, from governments who believe that government is legitimate, have done better. And that those who have actually bought into what I call a kind of free market ideology, which I think is true of the United States and to a very large degree of Great Britain, which is changing, of course, now, have done worse. And I think that will also have some consequences over the long term. Michael, you wanted to come in again, I think. I was just going to say that that um, somehow or other also that the, the left would have to, um, 
you know, really honestly address uh, the really the, the very big but pressing questions raised by man-made climate change and by um, uh, you know the the uh, rendering of workforces superfluous by enormous technological change, which is, sure. is only going to accelerate. And I think think sometimes I'm actually quite quite encouraged. I mean, the, mm. the woman who uh, Frances O'Grady who leads the trade union congress in britain she seems to me to be a fairly serious kind of person who does think about these sorts of issues mm. so i think once you've once you've informed people um you know without trying to mislead them or or fill their minds with with the sort of uh, cheap stunts that politicians daily stunts 24-hour stunts that politicians uh, go in for especially here of course uh, once you say, look, there are these very pressing long-term um, questions which are going to affect the lives of your children, your grand grandchildren, you know, you name it, entire continents, uh, then I think a new sobriety might might recommend itself. And you can see in this country where, you know, we have a sort of clown showman in charge that, that a rather um, dogged, um, ordinary professional lawyer is just tearing strips off him when they actually yeah. debate things together. I mean, he's a yeah. serious professional man and he wins every encounter. Yeah. So maybe we can do with a bit more of that. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay, so th this question is from Iqbal Habizon from Indonesia and I've um, paraphrased it again. Uh, is the old binary rivalry narrative of the Cold War skewing our understanding of the current world order, in particular regarding the US and China? Um, well, let me have a quick go at that and then hand over to Michael. Uh, I, I actually don't like the term Cold War applied to the US-China relationship. It sells books. Uh, it's, it's trendy to call it a second Cold War. In the same way, of course, that the Western relationship, EU relationship, the EU is called a new Cold War, and that sells books. And, you know, there's, there's something in it. There's something in it. If you mean by Cold War conflict or uh, an antagonism which bears resemblance to previous conflicts in the past. Uh, and nonetheless, I, maybe I'm an old essentialist or maybe I, I, I was too much bound up with the Cold War and, and too much bound up with the end of the Cold War to think that it's come back. I think the Cold War was a very specific moment in history. I think it was bound up with, first of all, the Soviet takeover of Eastern Europe. And once that ended, I think something called the Cold War began to come down very rapidly. It was bound up with the existence of the USSR across those 11 time zones and those what, 14 nationalities. That broke up in 1991. It was bound up with a kind of mission to change the world in a direction of planning and communism. And I don't see China doing that certainly not Russia. It was bound up with some kind of, as Fukuyama, I think, correctly put it, you know, between two visions of the future. Uh, and I don't, I don't see that really being where we are today. So I, I've always argued against these, uh, these the, the, using terminology drawn from the past, analogies from the past. And as good historians, I think we've always got to be aware of using our analogies rather promiscuously, more promiscuously than I think we should do. The other thing I'd say is that, that this doesn't actually make the world any safer. I think this is the worrying part. In some sense, and I mean this in a very qualified way, the Cold War also contained conflict as much as it was a, re a react. It was a conflict. Mm. And, um, you know, you knew where you were. You knew who your enemy was, <laughs> to go back to Carl Schmidt. You knew who your friends were. In this new world, it's very much more fluid. Look what's happened in Ukraine. In a way, that could never have happened in the, in the Cold War, but it certainly happened in a post-Cold War environment. The other thing I'd say, just to end my point, is the level of economic interdependence between China and the United States. I mean, China may not become like us in the sense of becoming a liberal polity, and I accept that. The Chinese... Communist Party is going nowhere, comrades. You know, it's going to stick around for a very long time indeed. Mm. It's got a certain ideological fixation on that. It also saw the USSR disintegrate. So it knows damn well that it ain't going to give up any power. 
to see China disintegrate, and they worry about that very, very deeply. Yet there is still an enormous amount of economic interdependence between the, the uh, China and the United States. And I, I'm not going to say that's going to override the power conflict or the power competition, but it will always mediate it, in my view. Michael? Yeah. I mean, I completely agree with that. You only have to read the uh, Financial Times or any other newspaper on a regular basis to see that, um, you know, if China sneezes or there's a you know, decline in GDP numbers or whatever, or in consumption patterns, uh, numbers more more importantly that it sends shudders through our economies i mean that's just a fact of the modern world and there was nothing resembling that in terms of the west relations with the former soviet union and i would add to mick that you know i've i've watched very carefully the growth of uh, sort of sinophobic hysteria in america britain and a few other places particularly over the huawei uh, thing uh, 5g network and uh, I mean, I could quite easily um, spend the rest of this uh, um, uh, Zoom conference pointing out the um, networks between Australia, America and Britain, which have deliberately fermented this, the think tanks which pump this out every day and which newspapers just regurgitate it day in, day out. I mean, some newspapers, you can't open them without hearing some sort of hysteria I mean oh, clearly there are many things wrong with China but the, the just the bombardment of this in the last six months to 12 months is incredibly striking and I have long come to the conclusion I will just make one more brief point that America is um, and I've lived there for three years uh, America is only happy really with um, peer competitors or strategic rivals who play the game that they play which is you know armed to the teeth just just think you know, it's a country with 700 overseas bases uh, china has one by the way in djibouti one and every you know look at magazines like the american interest half the uh, national interest i mean half the content is the latest super fighter the latest jet compared to the latest china one etc but what the Chinese are doing, which is, I think, that they've adopted Calvin, uh, Grover Cleveland's um, 1925 maxim, the business of America is business. America doesn't deal so well with a great power, which it is, whose uh, maxim is the business of China is business. That's the problem. They really don't know how to deal with this one. I, I, just, just a quick one there, Dave, if I could. I agree entirely with Michael on that. I mean, of course, everybody knows there are many problems with China. We've seen what's happened. It's appalling in Xinjiang, situation in Hong Kong. We always knew it was run by the Communist Party. You know, yep. tell me what's new. I mean, nothing is new. They've never actually said they're going to be anything other than a Communist Party with all that implies for the control of, of the citizenry of China. So nothing has fundamentally changed in that regard. Hmm. I mean, like Michael, although I think, you know, one's got to have a balanced approach to China, you know, one which recognizes the competitive element within the relationship, I would simply ask the rhetorical question. If we do get back to a fundamental conflict with China, question one, how are we going to prevent that spilling over into armed conflict in the end? You know, as, as our good friend Christopher Coker has written about these things very, very wisely and, and, and sagely, you know, something bad might happen down the line. It's not inevitable, but it's not improbable, as Christopher has put it. So I think we've got to look at the downsides of an escalating conflict between China and the United States and where it might lead to. Secondly, as, as I think you hinted at, Michael, and I'll just simply repeat the point, China is now something close to 15, 17% of the world economy. It's a huge market. It has a huge middle class. It has a huge economic capacity. It's helped the world economy recover from 2008. Mm. You know, it's one of the engines of the rest restoration of the Western economies. If we're going to throw all that out the window. And I think we've got to kind of think, what are the costs? Not what we call it. Who cares what we call it in relationship? What are going to be the costs of a breakdown in that relationship in, in ways that certainly Trump has been leading on? And which I'm afraid to say that some governments in this in Europe have been following. Okay. Uh, okay. So th uh, this might be the last question, but we'll see how we go. This is for from um, Shailen Popat of the University of Birmingham, 
and they ask, do you think that democratic governments have to ignore experts to be representative, i.e., is it a downside of democracy? <laughs> Michael? <laughs> God, I'm not, sure I, I'm not sure I follow that. Uh, do, they have to be, do they have to ignore experts in order to be a democracy? Is that what the question was? Uh, I would read it as, um, so the question was, do you think that democratic governments have to ignore experts to be representative, i.e. is that a downside oh. of the system? Well, I don't believe, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> so you understand the question now, Michael? I've got it now, no. Um, first of all, I, <laughs> I don't believe in, in direct democracy, and I think referenda are a complete disaster. I know they work in some sort of cantons in Switzerland or whatever, but they sure as hell don't work in California, and they don't work in a country like this or several others in Europe I could think of. So I'm not in favour of... Uh, of in, of direct democracy, I much prefer the um, almost oligarchic indirect version of it. Um, as, as for experts, I, I recently read a very good book as a, by someone called Nichols, I think it was, about the defence of expertise. I mean, yes, you can, you can dispense with uh, experts, but then you might uh, shudder inwardly before you um, brush your teeth or drink a glass of water from your bathroom tap. I mean, we are totally dependent on experts and have been for a very long time so the idea you can just dispense with experts in view and substitute the view of the man in the street or woman in the street is preposterous <laughs> I, I i i i would tackle the, the, the question maybe slightly differently although i think i probably come to the same conclusion as michael um i can actually understand why there's been a, a, a certain suspicion of experts uh, because actually quite a lot of experts got quite a lot of things wrong. Mm. If you like, there were quite a lot of liberal experts, if I can call them that, who kind of thought that globalization, you know, would, would solve all their problems. I think there were some like that. People who wrote in the Financial Times or in The Economist, Michael, I think they, they up, you know, they puffed up globalization. They, they ignored the downsides of it. And yeah. they certainly have taken advantage of that. And let's go back to the whole question of the 2008 crisis when our, and when our Queen in this country, in the United Kingdom, Queen Elizabeth II, asked an economist at the LSE when she was visiting it, why didn't you predict it six months later? I, th I think this is what happened. This may be an apocryphal story. They wrote a letter to the Guardian trying to answer the Queen's original question. In other words, the experts... The economic, I don't want to criticise all economists, certainly not myself, given I work at the London School of Economics, uh, and a lot of my friends and colleagues there are economists, but it seemed that the economists failed, you know, to, to anticipate uh, the mainstream economists. It was a crisis of economics as much as it was a crisis of the world economy in 2008. So I can kind of understand why there's been a backlash against it, or at least cr cr criticism of it. I, I get that. But I think as Michael has said, you know, I mean, if you want to have, you know, surgery on your brain, who do you want to do it? Well, I'd rather prefer to have a brain surgeon who's had 15 years experience, you know. You know, if I want to kind of talk about trade issues, I want to get somebody in there who actually knows the detail of trade. You know, and by the way, if I might put it rather bluntly about Michael and myself, if I want to get somebody to talk about international relations. Generally speaking, I'd like to get people who've been studying something for the last 30 or 40 years, rather than somebody who's kind of just picked up one or two blogs on, on, on the way through, through his or her own life. So, yeah. And Tony Fauci, who I mentioned, to me represents the very best of American science. Day after day, he's had to stand there and take it in the neck while President Trump talked about drinking all sorts of weird, weird and wonderful stuff. And he goes on and he's balanced, he's an expert, he knows the stuff. By the way, this virus has made us know how much we need our experts, because nobody else is going to get us out of this crisis. Can I just, um, can I just add one point? that um, I think that uh, something that Macron did when, when the yellow vests erupted, he, he revisited the 18th century um, 
you know, pre-revolutionary idea of cahiers de doléances, you know, lists of grievances, mm. where people wrote down. And he's done something. He did something rather similar. He had all these endless town hall meetings, and you know, it'll keep future historians working for half a century going through the through the fruits of it. But surely, to God, it's it's possible in our for some bright people to think of a way in which one could have citizens' forums or people could express their views about what after being told actually folks these these issues i don't know from criminal justice to climate change are really not simple we would like to hear what you say in a particular form we might even pay you to sit down mm. like a job and mm. talk about it and exchange views with experts and others and then maybe then people will feel better integrated into yeah. into their democracies because there clearly is a problem about um, a lot of people feeling they are excluded in mm. some way yeah or, or it, it, uh, even worse sometimes sneered at michael or sneered at or sneered at. as i said earlier on i think some of the reactions by certain intellectuals if you can call them that yeah. populism has been a sneer and i think that's entirely the wrong the wrong response there have been deep reasons some legitimate some maybe not so legitimate as you said why we we've had populism whether of the left or the right and we can't address the deeper causes of what's led to that secondly i'm i'm totally in favor you know of the kind of things you're talking about if i might say make a little plug for the lsc i mean one of the things the school has done increasingly well over the last 10 or 15 years public lectures in which you know the man or woman on the street comes in and can engage and we don't exclude anybody i think to me that's a great public service of a great public institution. And I think, again, that connects people who sometimes remain unconnected in ways that I think are absolutely important for the vitality of our democracy. Yeah. Seconded. The Ratchews are doing it too. Yeah, well, indeed. Uh, thank you to them as well for all the hard work they've done on our behalf. Dave? OK, well, we can fit this one last one in um, if, okay. if we sort of keep it relatively short. Gabor yeah. Batonyi. Bet uh, asks, and I think this is in uh, reference to Michael Burley's earlier comments that a leader such as Modi and Trump had a bad COVID. He says, um, uh, did the Central European po populists have a bad COVID? Like the, the, the big name leaders you referred to earlier. No, is that over for me? Sorry. For you um, this time, yeah. Well, I'm going to just, I'm just going to plead complete ignorance on that one but i would say that, that as far as i don't know duterte bolsonaro trump uh, putin actually had a real wobble as well and she she did as uh, as we tend to I, think, I, I think it's fair to say it. michael that countries yeah. like countries like poland and possibly hungary have actually come through this at the moment not too badly so i think you know yeah. what we said you know need didn't i suppose need some qualification yeah. question yeah. been asked so, yeah, but it's also its places. It's fair places. Question. Sorry, it, it is a fair question, but also its places. Obviously, where there's a a lot of sort of through traffic and a hell of a lot of people flying in and yeah. out. You know, no, that's, that's right. right. Yeah, that's why yeah. this country and America also some very so some countries you, you don't get on the radar screen of the debate in this country have had what you call a good co good good COVID for whatever whatever yeah. you want to say. One yeah. one actually has been Greece. Yeah, uh, no, definitely, yeah. Serbia at the very beginning had very, very strong control. Dare I say it, although I, want, I don't want to be misquoted on this, China, which in a way we get back to China, don't we always, Michael? Yeah. It may have started, it's had a, a kind of game of two halves, <laughs> you know, a pretty disastrous at the very beginning without, without a doubt in my view. Much will need to be investigated and talked about that in an open and fair way. But nonetheless, they kind of, got on top of it and you know unless i'm misreading everything or all the statistics are wrong so it's not just also a, a, a conflict between authoritarian governments and democ mm. democratic governments you know some very strong democratic governments have done well like germany taiwan south korea okay some authority you know so it's an it's it's there's no easy correlation on that one that's all i can say yeah fine that's that's it <laughs> okay over to you I think we might have to leave it there, Mick. Okay, I just want to say thank you, firstly, to, to Dave for chairing this very quickly. Mm -hmm. Thanks to Michael. I hope that debate opened up a large amount of further discussion amongst you. And uh, we'll, we'll continue here at Ideas to continue to 
engage in these in these in these questions in an open and I hope informed way. So thanks again for everybody for listening, Michael, for joining the conversation and for all the team here uh, for uh, supporting us. Thanks again, everybody, and have a have a have a good day or a good evening.